Okay, the project I'm going to tell you about is called the Focusing Optics X-ray Solar Imager, or FOXY project. And as was mentioned, this is a sounding rocket project that flew for the first time on November 2nd of 2012. And I'm happy to report that its first flight was a success. Uh, FOXY is a project that is a collaboration of the University of California, Berkeley, thank you very much, with Sam Crocker as the PI as well as the NASA Marshall Test Flight Facility in Alabama and the ISAS Institute in Japan. The outline of what I'll talk about is very simple. I'll tell you why we wanted to build this project in order to study high energy aspects of solar flares. I'll briefly describe the instrument and show you footage from the first <coughs> flight and then I'll describe some of our first results from the flight. If I don't talk too slowly, I'll tell you about some of the missions that we would like to do in the future. Okay, so why do we want to study solar flares? Solar flares are very large explosions that occur on the sun, and they can expel up to 10 to 33 ergs of energy. Now, it turns out that a great fraction of this energy goes into accelerated electrons and ions, and we know a bit about how this happens. We think that before the flare, the energy is stored in the magnetic fields of the corona, and the thing that probably sparks the flare is sudden magnetic reconnection or reconfiguration of the field into a lower energy state. But as far as how the energy actually gets transferred into particles, the details of that are still fairly unknown. As far as the tools we have available to study this, well, there are quite a few, but I'm going to focus on hard x-rays because they're really one of the most direct diagnostics of accelerated electron populations. And that's because these are emitted every time that you have a charged electron beam passing through ambient plasma. Most of the other observational tools that we can use tell you something about where the energy ends up or perhaps how the energy evolves in the later stages of a flare. But by studying hard x-rays, we have the best chance at investigating the energized particles themselves. <coughs> and the instrument that we'll typically use in order to do this is the RESI spacecraft. RESI was launched in 2002, and it's just completed its uh, 12th year on February 5th. Uh, it's still operational and still in good health, and RESI can observe from 3 kV all the way up to 17 MeV, or the gamma ray range. And RESI performs both imaging and spectroscopy, with one of the key points here being the fact that RESI is an indirect imager. So it does not use direct focusing optics. Instead, it uses an indirect imaging technique that requires Fourier transforms in order to recover the X-ray source map. Now, in the last 12 years, RESI has taught us a lot about how flares happen. This is the sort of standard picture over here with the solar surface at the bottom and everything upwards of that being the corona. And um, one of the things that we've learned about flares is that very faint hard X-ray sources in the corona, where we think the particle acceleration is occurring, tend to be a lot fainter than hard X-ray sources at the surface of the sun. And this isn't surprising because at the surface of the sun is the location where energetic electron beams thermalize and dump all of their energy there and emit quite strongly in X-rays. So most RESI observations look something like this. You can see the sources at the surface and also a thermal hot loop, but it's very rare that you can find something in hard X-rays farther up in the corona as in these very rare examples here. And so in order to study this issue in more detail, we need both better sensitivity in order to measure sources from the low density corona, and we also need better dynamic range in order to see those sources in the presence of very bright sources nearby. Uh, let me briefly discuss a separate issue that may be related to flares, and that's the coronal <laughs> heating problem. Uh, the corona is sitting at a, a couple million degrees even in quiescent times, whereas the photosphere or the surface of the sun is at about 5,800 degrees. And that's not what you would expect from thermodynamic equilibrium, so you must have some very large energy source in order to maintain that temperature. Uh, there are a variety of theories for what that might be, and one of those is that the corona could be heated by flares. We already know that those represent energy releases from the magnetic field. And in particular, several theories uh, involve nanoflares, which are small flares that could take place across the entire solar disk and essentially could be ongoing kind of all the time. And these could come about, for example, 
through braiding of magnetic field lines so that you have small energy releases all along this loop right here. Any one of those energy releases would be quite small, but if you add them all up and integrate over the whole solar disk, perhaps you can supply enough energy to heat the corona. But if these are true reconnection events and flares, then we should have accelerated electrons. And so far, we have not measured any hard X-rays from nanoflares in the quiet part of the sun, the most sensitive study having been done by Ian Hanna using RESI data. And so it turns out if we want to study this issue, we need better sensitivity in order to see these really faint flares. I'll now talk about how we want to achieve this, and that's by using direct focusing for hard X-rays. In order to focus hard X-rays, you need a very small angle of incidence, and the way you do that is with a configuration like this. Incoming photons come in this way, they bounce twice, once off two surfaces, each of two surfaces, and then <coughs> focus at a point some meters away from the optics. You can then produce these optics in complete revolutions like this in order to increase your effective area, and you can also stack together mirrors of different diameters, again, in order to collect more photons. Now, if you can do that, you get an immediate huge increase in sensitivity because you're focusing X-rays down to a small detector volume. And that has a dramatic effect on the background. <coughs> I put in some numbers to show that our project, as compared with the RESI <coughs> project, can decrease the background by a factor of 10,000. Uh, this increases sensitivity by a, a factor of perhaps 100 or two for background-dominated sources. Uh, it also turns out that these optics tend to have a, a very large dynamic range. I'll briefly mention that this has been the standard in soft X-ray astronomy for a long time, really for decades, <coughs> but it's only in the last 10 to 15 years that it's been possible to do it for hard X-rays. And here's a list of some of the projects that have done this. The solar projects are the ones in red, including the Foxy rocket, and uh, the most successful and well-known of, of the projects listed is the New Star Hard X-ray Observatory, which launched in the summer of 2012 and has been successfully observing faint astrophysics hard X-ray sources for the last year and a half. Okay, it's now time to talk about FOXY. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, FOXY is a sounding rocket payload, and it was funded by NASA's Low Cost Access to Space program. As a technological goal, what we want to do is to demonstrate the use of hard X-ray focusing optics for solar sources, as opposed to New Star doing the same for astrophysics sources. And as far as a scientific goal, what we would really like to do is use this technology to study particle acceleration in solar flares, in particular these very faint sources in the corona that are difficult to see with current instrumentation. But in the course of a five to six minute rocket flight, one cannot necessarily hope that you will have a solar flare during that time. And so for the purposes of this flight, we made our scientific goal to look for hard X-rays from nanoflares indicating accelerated electrons, and try to characterize the energy content of those flares and compare it with the energy needed to heat the corona. And as I said, we had our first flight on November 2nd of 2012. The technological heart of FOXY are the electroformed focusing hard X-ray optics that were produced at NASA Marshall by Brian Ramsey's group. And there's a photograph of some of the mirrors here of various diameters. These do actually have two different shapes in them, a hyperbolic and parabolic section, although they're so slight that you can't really see them in the photograph. And then these mirrors are nested together in sets of seven to produce a, a full module as is shown here. And each of these modules has seven mirrors. Foxy consists of a total of seven of these modules, so there are 49 mirrors altogether. Uh, these optics have a, a point spread function with a resolution of five or six arc seconds, full width half max, and a half power diameter of about 25 arc seconds, at least on axis. Then at the under, other end of the payload, we have silicon strip detectors. There's a diagram of how that works here. By using double-sided detectors, we can get two-dimensional information about where photons interact within the detector. And these detectors were generously donated by the Astro-H group at ISAS, led by Professor Tadayuki Takahashi, who is the PI of Astro-H. Uh, the strip pitch of these detectors is 75 microns, and that corresponds to about 7.7 .7 arc seconds at our focal length. These have an energy resolution of about half a keV. Here's what the whole thing looks like when it's put together. We have the optics at this end with seven of these modules, 
paired with seven dedicated silicon detectors on this side, that means that every optics module has its own detector, so you can kind of think of this as seven different telescopes put together. That way, if something happens with one of these, it doesn't affect the performance of the others. Uh, these plots are meant to give you an idea of what FOXY can do. Um, this plot has a, a lot of lines on it. It shows the effective area of the instrument. I'll only talk about this blue line, which is the effective area for this first flight. Uh, the effective area for a, a future funded flight is shown in red. And um, the important thing to note here is this area compared with the effective area of the RESI spacecraft, which is shown here. You can see that around 10 keV, we got an increase of a factor of, of two or three, perhaps. And then I'll remind you that due to our drastically reduced background, we have another huge jump in sensitivity for background-dominated sources. Uh, I won't discuss this one in detail for time's sake, but it shows the point spread function of FOXY, and you can see that it drops off very quickly from the brightest part of the source as compared with RESI, which doesn't really drop off more than an order of magnitude. In the fall of 2012, we took the payload to the desert, to the White Sands Missile Range, for our first launch attempt. And here's some footage of us working at the, the range. When, while we were there, we did the final tests of the instrument. We integrated the experiment with the rest of the payload, performed all of the vibration tests and measurements that are necessary in order to fly. And then this is what it looks like when the whole thing is put together on the, the launch rail. So these are the two motors for the rocket. And then the entire experiment section that I showed you earlier is contained within this styrofoam box here. And the first flight occurred on November 2nd of 2012 at 1755 UT. We observed for six and a half minutes above 150 kilometers, and that's the altitude that is necessary in order to avoid the, the effects of atmospheric attenuation. Uh, in that time, we observed four targets, and this image is meant to give you an idea of where those were located. So the background image here is an extreme ultraviolet image supplied by the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and the four boxes show you where FOXY was pointing. Uh, we have some active regions or regions of high solar activity in the first two targets. The third target is meant to be a very clean measurement of the quiet part of the sun. And the fourth target also includes an active region that was just almost rotating off the solar disk. As you can see from the, the count profile here, for the first three targets, we had very low measured counts. This is less than 10 counts per second. And this was a bit of a surprise to us. We had thought that hot thermal plasma from these active regions would dominate the emission and give us an important check out of the instrument. As it turned out, that wasn't the case. But once we switched to the final target, our counts jumped by over an order of magnitude. And it turned out that this was because there happened to be a small solar flare in progress from this active region right here. So earlier when I told you that one cannot possibly hope to measure a solar flare during a rocket experiment, it turns out that I was very fortunately wrong about that. And as I said, that was unexpected, but it is very fortunate. And so we will try to leverage this observation of the flare to the maximum possible, especially because RESI also observed it. So this provides an important check out of the instrument since we can compare with RESI. So I'll now show some data from FOXY in comparison with RESI, and I'll start with a, a RESI image of the flare, which is this. Uh, here we're looking at about one-fourth of the solar disk, maybe a little bit less, and this black line shows you the edge of the sun. The flare occurred right here. It was actually partly occulted, so the, the brightest parts of this flare occurred behind the solar disk, and we just have sources in the corona and this is actually the only real source in the image. Everything else you see here are artifacts that are caused by RESI's <coughs> indirect imaging process and poor dynamic range. So let's look at the same image for FOXY. I should first point out that in principle, RESI can actually measure the entire solar disk at once, but here I've, I've produced an image that is cropped to FOXY's field of view. The FOXY image looks like this. We have the flare here, just like we did over here, but we are largely free of the imaging artifacts that showed up in the RESI image, and this is due to the increased dynamic range that we have with a direct focusing instrument. You could imagine that if you, if you wanted to measure another source in addition to this bright flare, say small nano flares that are happening on the disk, 
With this image, it would be impossible to do that. With this one, we'd have a shot. Let's now zoom in on that flare and see what it looks like in a, a bit more detail. We're again comparing with Resi. So this is a, a Resi image on the left. You can make out perhaps a bit of loop, loop structure here. And this is the Foxy image on the right overlaid on top of an extreme ultraviolet image. So the white contours show the Foxy image. And here you can distinctly see the loop and you can see that it matches up quite well with the hot plasma that is seen in EUV. Okay, so these are images of the flare, but what about all of those other targets that I showed you earlier in which we saw very, very low count rates? Is there anything to be seen there? Well now, armed with our comparison with RESI, we can turn our attention to the quiet sun and try to see if there is any statistical signal that we can work out from the data. Here is all of the data that we collected with FOXY in our second target, which represents 90 seconds. And this target includes some area on the disk, which is this, and also a great deal of area off the disk, which is all of this. Here the black boxes show you the field of view of each of the individual detectors. Now the immediate thing that you notice is that although there are not very many counts in this image, this is very coarsely binned and the maximum bin has perhaps 10 counts in it, there is an asymmetry here. So you see many more counts on the disk than you do off the disk. Uh, that means that this could not be some sort of uniform background, in which case you would expect the counts to be spread out across the entire detector. And in fact, it also turns out that the on and disk counts have different spectra, indicating that this is something, or is probably something, that's on the disk. Now, what could this be? Uh, could this be thermal emission from an active region? Probably not. There were active regions in this field of view, but this emission is kind of spread out across the total observed disk. Could it be hard X-ray emission from nano flares in the quiet sun? Maybe, though we're not ready to make that statement. Before we can say anything definitive about that, we still need to rule out any extraneous instrumental effects. And the, the most important one of those is something that's referred to as ghost rays from the solar flare. I'll remind you that the solar flare is currently going on on this side of the sun over here. And so if there could be some stray flux from that flare, perhaps we could pick that up in this second target here. Uh, so stay tuned on that work to see if we actually do find something statistically sig significant on the sun. Okay, let me say a bit about what we would like to do in the future. We are funded for a second flight and that will hopefully take place within the year. We'll have some technological upgrades and we'll hopefully fly for again five or six minutes. Uh, we plan to replace the silicon detectors with cadmium telluride detectors and also add additional mirrors to each optics module and this will allow us to get to slightly higher energies, perhaps 20 kV instead of 15 kV for this flight. I should note that the energy range is mainly limited by the focal length that you can fit inside your instrument. So with a rocket flight, we're limited in that respect. With something like a balloon or a spaceborne observatory, we would be much less limited. There have also been um, at least one other project that has used these optics or a similar type of optics to look at the sun, and that's the HEROES balloon. Earlier you may have seen the HERO balloon on the list. It's an astrophysics balloon that has been revamped to be able to observe the sun. And that flew earlier this year in September. Unfortunately, it happened to be the quietest solar week of the year. Um, but that will allow them to set some sensitivity limits on coronal nanoflares. And of course, what we'd really like to do in the future is to put this type of technology on a spacecraft. If we did have a spaceborne observatory, for example, with an extendable boom, as is shown here, then we could achieve a longer focal length and could observe up to about 80 keV or so. And this would be very appropriate for studying power laws from solar flare accelerated electrons. And uh, with this, there's a, a variety of phenomena that we could look at. I'll also mention another instrument that is not a dedicated solar mission. And I actually brought this one up earlier. This is the New Star Observatory that launched about a year and a half ago. Now, as I said, New Star was made to observe faint astrophysical sources. That means that it's not optimized to look at the sun. But since it's there and it has the technology that we would like to use, as well as a very high sensitivity, then why not use it to look at the sun? And so there are solar observations within the baseline program, and we expect to get about three weeks of solar observing sometime in the next half year or so. Uh, I should note that 
since new star was optimized for astrophysics sources and not solar sources, the count rate is very limited. So this will perhaps not be the instrument to use to look at very bright, large solar flares like we do with RESI, but it will be particularly good at looking for faint signals, for example, the signals from nano flares in the quiet sun. Uh, here is a plot of effective area once again with the FOXY effective area shown here. That's the area for the first flight. Here's RESI, the dotted line. And then this one is new star. So you can see how much more sensitive new star is in terms of effective area. And it also does have the reduced background. This is now on a, a log scale. OK, so I would like to conclude with just a, a few thoughts. One is that we have succeeded in producing the first focused imaging spectroscopy of a solar flare at hard X-ray energies. And there are some other instruments that will continue doing this work as well along the way. But the main take home message that I'd like you to have is that this technology is now ready to go. Hard X-ray focusing optics have been built, they've been tested, and it's been demonstrated that they work both for astrophysical sources and for solar sources. Um, so this technology can and should be used to observe solar flares, and there are some strong scientific drivers for doing that. Now I just have one more note which is that I would like to dedicate this prize to Professor Bob Lin. He was my thesis advisor, and he left us quite suddenly just a few weeks after the first flight of FOXY. So I would like to thank him for his kind guidance over the years, and FOXY came about largely through his inspiration. So I'm glad he was able to see the project's success. Thank you. So we've got a few minutes for questions. Every time I point an X-ray telescope at the sun, it kills the X-ray telescope. <laughs> oh, was Robert Lynn was first point out that um, the uh, isotopic um, HE34 ratio in the solar wind wallops around by a large amount, and in fact the HE34 ratio is is on occasion enhanced to 1,000 times, which is rather quite something, and nobody else has picked it up subsequently. Uh, can these things be observed in uh, synchrotron radiation by radio astronomy? Yes. And if so, isn't that cheaper? <laughs> <laughs> it's less fun. Good question. Yes, they can be observed using microwaves instead, particularly via gyrosynchrotron emission. And I think that's probably the other best diagnostic of electron populations. And so what is often done, and what we'd like to keep doing, is to study both the hard x-rays and microwaves together, because in principle, they could tell us about a continuous electron population, but they tell us about different parts of that energy range. And so the, the information from both of those together is quite useful. John right at the back, I couldn't see who it was for a minute. Sorry about that. Yeah, the quick answer, the, the answer to Don's question is that it is much cheaper, but the magnetic field is so uncertain, you don't get a good measure, you, you don't get a good measure of the electron flux, which is what you really want. Whereas we do know the density of the solar atmosphere quite well. More questions? I don't see any, so thank you very much to our speaker again.